Japanese contract law is just intrinsically interesting because it's a very nice, very modern example of um, a civil law approach to thinking about contracts of all kinds. Most of my work has been on long term contracts. So one of the features of uh, business domestically in Japan and transnationally has been, at least in the past, reliance on long term business relationships. And when those are created within the fabric of a contract, both the law and the courts, when they interpret that law in Japan, code those contracts with particular features and courts are particularly attentive to the uh, power relationship between the two parties and fairly deferential to uh, what it means to be in a long-term business uh, relationship. As far as Japanese contract law is concerned, it seems to me that uh, it is a sort of a mixture of many uh, contract law. It is based, mainly based on uh, continental uh, contract law, mainly uh, maybe German contract law and French contract law. However, uh, the influence of uh, common law jurisdiction has been uh, large, especially after the World War II era. And so, you know, it, it could, uh, Japanese contract law maybe could, may be regarded as a sort of a a fruit of a comparative uh, contract law. It is a very uh, interesting phenomenon since um, most uh, jurisdictions, including German and French, they are very much uh, have its own roots. But uh, Japanese contract law is based on many uh, rules, which has its roots in uh, many other jurisdictions. So it is a sort of a mixture of many uh, jurisdictions. And th that is probably the one of the most interesting uh, features of Japanese contract law. Uh, do you think that uh, that disjunction perhaps between what's written in the law and books in the Japanese code or in the court judgments and the actual commercial practices uh, on the ground is something that's particularly uh, significant and different in Japan in the past and now days? Uh, yeah. so it's a great question. Um, and we, we need to be fairly precise about what period of time we're, we're talking about. Um, business practice has changed in Japan over the past few decades as it has everywhere, in part through the application of technology. So the uh, creation um, of um, business transactions and the fulfilment of orders now being done electronically uh, rather than through an exchange of documents. And then the second um, phenomenon that uh, is really visible in Japan is, is a gradual legalisation or the, um, the gradual um, reliance on lawyers, whether those are in-house legal staff or whether they are counsel external to the company. It depends, of course, on the size of the, the company or the enterprise as well. If you're a big transnational, um, multinational uh, company headquartered in Japan, you're going to be more formal and more legalistic in the way that you um, do your transactions because there are implications for your insurance and for um, your share price if you're a listed company. Whereas if you're a smaller operation, you have a smaller budget to spend on legal advice. And uh, you may in fact um, need help from, from other intermediaries. So all of those shifts in the market and shift in the legal services market and application of technology matter quite a great deal. But if we're looking at what's distinctive about having a civil code grounded system um, of the kind that Professor Yoshimasa was describing, one of the things that will uh, perhaps surprise an Australian observer will be the relatively big role that's given to the concept of good faith. So the civil code provides that all contracts have to be created and performed in accordance with an obligation of good faith. And you might say, okay, well, that sounds fairly straightforward, but it starts to matter quite a lot when parties want to exit from the transaction. And that is particularly visible in transactions that have been going on for over a long period of time. 
So there's um, an interesting case from uh, 2011 where an Australian wine producer had contracted with um, a distributor in Japan and the distributor was their exclusive distributor for the Japanese market. And the wine producer and the, producer and the distributor had been in business together for 17 years. The distributor wasn't reaching the kinds of sales targets that the wine producer hoped for. And so the wine producer said, look, you know, this isn't working. You either need to lift that volume of sales or we're going to have a problem. Four months later, the wine producer in Australia terminated the distribution agreement. And the distributor in Japan at that point claimed against the producer and demanded damages for the termination of that contract. Now, an Australian observer might say, well, this looks a little strange. It was the distributor who wasn't doing the job. Surely it's the distributor who's in breach. But as it turns out, under some applications of Japanese contract law, it's actually the wine producer in Australia who's in breach. And the breach that they are um, guilty of is not giving adequate notice to the distributor in the context of a business relationship that had uh, continued for 17 years. So good faith would say that the distributor has a legitimate um, belief that the business transaction will go on absent any clear showing to the contrary and therefore to be terminated quite suddenly is in fact a breach of the contract. And the court in that particular case upheld the uh, distributor's claim for eight months of profits. So the remaining eight months of a 12, what should have been a 12 month notice period. Now that kind of reading of good faith could come as a shock to uh, an Australian uh, business person or legal advisor who might view um, this transaction in a much more uh, clear cut way. It had been argued that the uh, Japanese firms rely very little on uh, written contract forms and they uh, rely more on the relationship between the parties and uh, negotiation, uh, informal negotiations between the parties. But as uh, Professor Taylor has already mentioned, I think uh, the situation is recently changing. Uh, because many large uh, Japanese farms, uh, multinational farms, have large legal sections with uh, many uh, in-house lawyers. And uh, large law firms in Tokyo uh, downtown are drafting very thick uh, contracts, very detailed contracts. And they, uh, they draft their contract uh, based upon the legal uh, terms in uh, mainly in common law jurisdictions. They draft their contracts in English and uh, the terminology may be a bit different from the ones in Japanese uh, law. So on, on, the, on the one hand, there are many uh, law firms drafting uh, very detailed uh, contracts. But on the other hand, uh, there are many more uh, small, uh, medium-sized enterprises, and they still con uh, they continue to rely uh, very little on written contract. Uh, what what is uh, written on the contract forms? Uh, very interesting uh, phenomenon. I would like to introduce a very uh, interesting phenomenon in the course of the uh, reform of Japanese civil code law on obligations. Uh, in the process of the reform, uh, many participants, many uh, members had argued that the, in, in the field of contract law, uh, the interpretation of contract must be uh, the starting point, must be the base for all the uh, dispute resolution. But very interestingly, uh, many legal attorneys had argued that the Japanese uh, contracts are not well drafted and they should not, uh, the court should not rely too much on what is written on the contract. Uh, the court should take, much, uh, take other elements into account when deciding the cases. Uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, good faith principles uh, or other uh, social norms and so on. So uh, there are many, still many uh, small, medium sized enterprises and the legal attorneys who rely very little on con uh, drafted contracts. 
And so, you know, the situation is very um, sort of ambivalent. Uh, on the one hand, there, is a bit, there are uh, many large enterprises drafting very detailed contracts based on the uh, uh, terminology of uh, common law jurisdictions. But on the other hand, there are still uh, small, medium-sized enterprises uh, which have no uh, access, which have very little access to uh, legal resources and rely little on uh, contract, uh, uh, written contract terms. And that is my uh, general observation. Thank you. Can I ask you as another general question, uh, whether there are any other major areas of change that you've observed in Japanese contract law uh, or practice over the last few decades, uh, such as the civil code amendments, obviously, but any others, and as well as any uh, major uh, transformations you might expect over the next uh, decade or two in the field of Japanese contract law and practice. Something that we haven't talked about directly is uh, the category of uh, contracts that affect consumers. And Professor Yoshimasa pointed out correctly that one of the really big social changes in Japan in the latter half of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century has been demographic change. Japan is the world's most rapidly aging society. And so when you uh, read um, current commentary on uh, trends in Japanese contract law, it's clear that there are many scholars in Japan who are very concerned about how to think about contract when your average consumer is no longer a young person or a person who is, uh, in a sense, the fully autonomous rational actor that um, uh, a kind of neoliberal uh, idea of contract would imagine. So in Australian contract law, you basically have two categories of people. You have someone who's competent to form a contract um, by themselves, and you have people who are not competent to form contracts by themselves. And those people are people who are not adults and people who are in incapacitated, whether for physical or for mental health reasons. And then you have another separate category of people who um, require guardianship and who are legally determined to be incapable of any legal acts, not, not only contract. But what many uh, commentators in Japan are concerned about is a rather more fuzzy category of older people in Japan who might be living alone uh, on a pension and who are caring for themselves in a day-to-day -day sense, but who are really not well equipped to cope with online transactions, uh, fraudulent phone calls from people who are trying to persuade them to enter into uh, very exploitative contracts um, or um, uh, sales transactions that um, are, uh, involve you know, delivery of products or, or go on and on forever. Um, also who really can't process digital information very effectively. Um, what do you do about those people? Because they're, they're legally competent, but they're not really um, fully equipped to cope with the speed or the detail or the um, degree of exploitation um, that is sometimes uh, built into particularly standard form contracts. So that's a big issue. There's no single solution. When those cases in small numbers eventually get to the courts, the courts in Japan have for the most part been quite clear cut about the fact that um, where there's a, a really dramatic power imbalance and a really dramatic um, imbalance of information, the, um, the remedy must uh, go towards the, uh, the person who is um, elderly. But, you know, that the number of cases coming before the courts is just a tiny fraction of the actual number of social transactions. So what we see as a pattern is also lots of um, sort of small piecemeal legislative attempts to keep pace with this sort of predatory uh, business behaviour. And I say predatory not because it's 
uh, unique to Japan, but simply because this is a style of capitalism and financialization that we're seeing playing out in Japan. And I think that makes Japan a very important place to look at um, uh, in terms of how consumers and contracts uh, are being thought about. Can I just end by asking each of you, particularly Professor Yoshimasa, who's written an interesting paper on this recently in a symposium comparing developments to the in Japan compared to Germany in, in the COVID pandemic era. Uh, you know, what have been the uh, interesting responses uh, and likely further developments uh, in contract law in Japan uh, arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Professor Notage had also uh, joined uh, the conference online and he had kindly uh, referred to my uh, presentation on the effect of COVID-19 on Japanese contract law. And in that pre presentation, I, I argued uh, that the Japanese contract law seemed to uh, be more flexible compared to uh, German contract law and the Japanese lawyers, Japanese jurists tend to uh, react to the pandemic by applying the existing uh, legal doctrines uh, more flexibly. Uh, on the other hand, uh, German legislators have adopted many uh, important, important legislations in the field of contract law so, uh, one being a so-called uh, moratorium, uh, the postponement of the pay due date of the payment. But uh, Japanese legislators uh, uh, ne never uh, seriously considered adopting such uh, drastic measures to react to uh, the pandemic. And, and Jap Japanese lawyers uh, tend to react by, by applying the existing legal doctrines. Uh, for example, uh, by applying uh, the, the article on uh, damages and the damage, uh, more specifically, it is uh, article 415 of uh, Japanese civil code, providing that the damages may be exempted uh, when uh, the non-performance is caused by uh, the reasons which are not attributable to uh, the debtor. And by applying the uh, article flexibly, uh, maybe courts will uh, allow uh, the exemption of the parties in some cases. And there are more uh, other doctrines uh, which are uh, based, uh, as Professor Taylor has mentioned, uh, based, which, is, which is based on uh, doctrine of uh, good faith and uh, other more uh, flexible uh, legal grounds. And by applying those uh, doctrines and flexible rules, uh, Japanese courts are able to react to the uh, pandemic. So the, the reaction uh, of uh, both uh, civil law countries and Japanese contract law having its base on German uh, contract laws, they, they both, so at first I, you might expect them to react in the same way, but uh, in reality, they, their reaction was pre pretty different. One being uh, more, uh, one Jap namely Japanese law, uh, reacting to the pandemic by applying the existing rules more flexibly. And on the other hand, the German law, uh, German legislators uh, drafted uh, the new uh, legal rules and to, to react to, to the pandemic. So the reactions were pretty much different and that reaction, the difference seemed very interesting to me as a, a legal professor.